Welcome everyone to the remote leader distance but not removed session by Alberta and Martina. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Alberta. So let's jump straight into the session and why, um, why we did uh, this uh, piece of uh, research. Uh, we did this piece of research because in case you've not noticed, uh, the world as we know has completely changed in the last year and a half. Uh, I know that I would have never in my wildest dream thought that we would have a pandemic and that the pandemic would change everything, not just about how I work, but about how I live. Um, and we were just looking at the news. It looks like we're not out of it. Uh, it's uh, uh, Austria just announced that they're going back into lockdown and vaccines are mandatory. COVID numbers are uh, all over the place at the moment. Vaccines work, vaccines don't work. I believe they work, by the way. But the world is a completely different place. So Martina and I, um, we, we started wondering the question, uh, what's happening to, to the world work? I mean, organizations have had to adapt. They've had to deploy tools to allow the economy to continue. They've had to decide, uh, you know, whether workers could work remotely by respecting all the constraints. And, uh, and we came to the conclusion that we did not have a good answer. And so we decided to poll uh, people around the world to understand how their um, management and how their teams, how the people that actually do the transformation, that do all the things that, that keep the world running, um, were coping with these new changes. Now, before Martina begins taking us through what we found, I want to spend a minute talking about the people that we talked to, so the mm -hmm. demographic. We... Uh, so we have representation from all over the world, um, possibly you know, skewed towards uh, the Americas and Europe, mostly because those are the places where Martin and I have worked uh, the most. Um, we wanted to know whether uh, people, uh, irrespective of the fact that now we had to work remotely, if people were in the same geography or we were talking about uh, global teams, we uh, wanted to understand the kind of organizations we were talking with. And so there is, there is a fairly distributed representation of, you know, in light blue, uh, you know, really large multinational corporations. And then you got very small, what we call Soho's, so sole proprietor um, organizations, but the spread was, uh, was interesting. We also, because the, the, the aim of this research was focused at leadership, we wanted to understand how many people uh, our responded were responsible for overseeing. And here too, we see that there are, the vast majority has teams of one to five people. Um, teams of 10 plus people worried us a, a little bit because it's very difficult to manage effectively large numbers of people and give them you know, the attention that they require uh, in person, imagine remotely. And then uh, we wanted to know how, you know, if you were to look at the org charts, how many indirect reports there were. And here I would say the vast majority was uh, below, uh, below 50 overall, direct and indirect. Then, and this was crucial to ask certain question. We wanted to know whether remote leadership was a new, new experience for our respondents or if it was something that they had dealt with because they were dealing with global teams that were dispersed uh, geographically. And, and it's interesting that um, hybrid management, so half in person, uh, roughly, you know, part in person, part, uh, part remote and remote leadership were common before the pandemic. So only 30% had to start because of the pandemic. And we created sets of questions that applied to the different circumstances. And um, finally, we wanted to know 
for the people who had managed remote teams before, we wanted to know how long people had been managing uh, teams remotely. And I would say about, about half of them uh, was between two and five years. And the other half uh, was uh, above, um, up to you know, more than 10 years. With that said, so this was the population we were talking to. I'll pass on to Martina to start taking us to, through what we found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've uh, we've looked at, you know, what have the experienced remote leaders, um, what, what are they reporting back? Then we're looking at um, what um, what a new um, remote leaders um, uh, have found. And uh, and we're also looking at, you know, where, where do they where do they overlap? What, what have both cohorts uh, um, reported back similarly? So let's go through the experienced remote leaders first. And um, Really first question, you know, what, what's been working? What's what's working well for you? And um, not surprising at all that uh, uh, it came through really strongly that, you know, giving people trust uh, is, uh, is really critical. Um, being able to carefully um, uh, uh, improve and refine asynchronous communication across the team is, uh, is a key foundation to be able to um, foster that trust, being able to create social spaces in, uh, in those communications and in your daily interactions, again, to, to foster that trust. And as a remote leader, how do you show up in all of those digital places um, uh, so the team feels your presence even when they're not collaborating directly with you? So that notion of, you know, in the office, of course, they know where you are. You're all milling around the space. You know, there's easy touch points. But how do you bring that into the into the digital space? And the second point um, is is an evergreen, really. Um, whether it's uh, you know, doesn't matter what's going on within the team, within the organization, or in the world at large. Uh, your your team really um, responds well to follow through if you say you know if you say you're going to do something if there's an action if there's some feedback they really appreciate seeing you actually follow through on that being able to trust that you're going to do what you say uh, what you say you're going to do that really sort of builds a lot of trust and inevitably uh we don't get everything right right but you're building that social capital that when things don't go right you're in this together as a team right you're solving the problems with the team uh they're not solving problems for you and uh really critical in in trying to solve uh gnarly challenges and then of course the third one creating connection right and whether that's uh peer-to-peer -peer amongst the team you know trying to recreate that feeling of being in the space together even casually keeping uh, perhaps your video channel open during the day, not in a sort of direct, uh, not as a direct uh, meeting, but, but just to, to foster that feeling of we're around each other while we're working, perhaps by ourselves. Um, and uh, asynchronous stand-ups, really setting an intention for the day, being able to do that even when we're not around in the same space, but not even in the same time zone. So um, on the one hand, you know, creating that intent on the other, also just getting a lovely glimpse into everyone's lives and uh, creating that connection. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I have a, I yeah. actually have a question. Um, uh, and thank you, Jitendra, for saying that. I have a question for the audience right now, mm -hmm. because in, if we were in the room, we would be doing it. Um, we would be doing it uh, saying, show your hands. So uh, would you be able to maybe raise your hands or put in chat um, if you've experimented with uh, this idea of keeping a video channel open in your office uh, and let us know if you've done that, if that has worked for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried it with my team. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I personally found it terribly distracting because I didn't know if I was working, looking at the screen. Uh, and then I was like, oh my God, what if I put my finger in my nose or what? <laughs> is, you know, and, and so it'd be really interesting to understand from the, um, from, uh, the attendees whether you've tried uh, any of that. And as uh, Jitendra was saying, please, if you do have questions, pop them in the chat. Um, 
uh, and and we'll see. And yeah, uh, switching on the camera in each meeting goes a long way. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking about that, right? We saw something about being on camera. Mm -hmm. So positive, it's really positive because it mm -hmm. creates connection. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 camera on work for us as well. Yes, that's great. Um, to your point, actually, while, while more uh, messages coming in, um, I've had both, like I've had teams who've really loved having that uh, channel open, right? And it's on a screen, not pointing at someone in particular, but at the room at large. And it's just milling about and really enjoying that, yeah. you know, between different offices. Others, um, yeah, others were more feeling like, hmm, this, this is kind of intrusive, right? Yeah, and, and I'm yeah. feeling like I'm on a presentation platter all day. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Leader has to be visible and approachable during team connects and sync ups. 100% that. Mm -hmm. That's, that is our, you know, as leaders, that is our main job. Mm -hmm. So let's go uh, to the next slide because, um, you know, th there's something else that has worked for teams, right? for experienced leaders, right? Absolutely. And with that being, uh, being visible and creating connection, it's also about providing clarity for the team, right? Clarity of objectives, priorities, and success criteria. That really helps to generate that common understanding, um, common uh, understanding of what we're trying to achieve. And it really um, sets up um, it sets up the team for working autonomously better and uh, and to be able to make good decisions asynchronously when you're not there to, uh, um, to help guide that decision making. Um, the next thing came through, the next point came through really strongly as well, that over communicate, even if you feel it's excruciatingly overemphasizing and it feels redundant. But it's really important for remote teams and also be incredibly explicit how you're going to document conversation, how you're creating that in a, in a visible channel, not in one-to-one -one interactions, whether it's verbal or, or in direct chat. But, uh, you know, document that, make it clear uh, what the communication channels are and then what to use for uh, which channel to use for what so everyone knows where to look for uh, information uh, and which uh, and how to best share information as well. And then the third one, uh, remote collaboration, of course, is really underpinned by um, great remote sharing collaboration and communication tools. I was actually really disheartened to hear about how hard it has been even at the beginning of the pandemic, not just beforehand, for teams to get the funding, to get the approval, to actually invest in the right tools to be able to do to work well together. And I think we've often found that kind of challenge when we were a remote team and the rest of the org wasn't. And it's was like, why would you need that? You know, that seems, you know, we don't need that. Why do you need that? But um, but also not just the technology, but also, you know, how do you, what's the process? How do you work together? And don't assume that, you know, because it's natural or easy or understandable to you or some people in the team uh, that everyone, uh, everyone can embrace that without, uh, you know, um, uh, onboarding and documenting that process and that tool. Yeah, and I can see here, there, there's some comments around mm -hmm. creating casual connections, uh, mm -hmm. online whiteboarding tools to the point of remote yeah. collaboration. Uh, and and yes, I'm Kit, and I'm, I'm hoping that I, I'm not butchering your names. Uh, so I apologize in advance if I say something incorrect. Um, you're right. Uh, good collaboration tools should be needed even before the pandemic. Hari, you said um, in a previous comment something around camera on, camera off, and we'll get to that uh, in just in just a second. So we're not ignoring that. There's a, there's something specific, yeah, in our data about that. Absolutely, and. Um when we're looking at what's changed since COVID, and again, this is for people who've been leading remotely for, for quite some time beforehand. Um, it's really like, despite having been set up for working remotely, of course, working remotely during a pandemic is actually quite a different experience. It's uh, much more stressful. There's so much uncertainty inside and outside of work. It's, it's created a really high stress environment for everybody. Um, and in terms of work processes, some teams were incredibly well set up already, but like, do you know what? Nothing's changed for us when it comes to actually how we work. Uh, we've always been remote first and how lucky in this, uh, in this circumstance, we can all learn from, from that expertise and experience. But, you know, again, 
the biggest challenge has been that you know the team have been dealing with a lot of personal challenges so it's it's a uh, it's an um it's interesting to have to resolve that when you're actually not in the same space together yes and to this point um Bavin, I think I think it makes uh, it makes uh, your comment is absolutely uh, spot on. Some people are uncomfortable about mm. being visible all the time, as you yeah. were saying, Martina, yeah. and so it becomes really difficult to address those personal challenges that you were just referring to, right? So yeah. that one-to-one -one communication, as Bavin was saying in, in their comment, is, is really important, especially because the novelty of being working from home. Mm -hmm. and putting a load of laundry on <laughs> or you know dinner on the stove yeah. kind of wears off yeah. really quickly right mm -hmm. it doesn't outweigh the stress of the situation really yeah and then uh, you know morale goes down decision making slows down etc cetera, etc cetera. but that one-to-one -one trust you know in the relationship mm -hmm. that's what holds it together absolutely so we're coming back uh uh to your to your point you know people are really reporting that video call overload right i feel like i'm on screen all the time more than a professional tv presenter and i think uh, it's interesting how zoom fatigue has made it into the sort of general vocabulary not just people like ourselves who work in tech right who've, who've been on video calls before the pandemic but uh, it's interesting how that's uh become incredibly pervasive for everybody so and with that oh you, yeah, there's actually a really good comment here okay. from Chandan. And again, apologies if I'm butchering your names. I really, I really am sorry. Uh, it, it's lovely that, uh, you know, of course, it is it is very difficult to when you have living in um, less than ideal circumstances, mm -hmm. maybe you, you know, you, you're in a crowded house, you have family members living with you uh thank god for backgrounds uh mm. but 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 bandwidth then become an issue and it's yeah. lovely that uh you know organizations that pay additional amounts to compensate mm. for you know allowing someone to upgrade their bandwidth etc mm. etc it's um i mean it's something that honestly should be common sense i don't know why more organizations don't do that but it is it goes a long way right Mm -hmm. But there aren't just challenges, I think, uh, since COVID started, right? Uh, um, we read something that for some experienced leaders that were struggling before pandemic with um, this idea that their in-person teams were way more present and way more relevant, and the remote teams felt like second-class citizens, um, that relationship completely changed once the mm -hmm. pandemic uh, came because everybody was um, was remote, right? And so it did help down, it did help break down geographical boundaries. And, um, and I think that as leaders in the organization, model the right behaviors yeah. that becomes even more important absolutely and just looking at uh, at more of the chat absolutely and being uh, mindful about you know different circumstances of your teams and and modeling good behavior on on all sides whether to actually be present but also you know having to deal with uh you know the challenging uh home uh, circumstances around uh around being able to be on video or not and and actually just being able to take care of your family as well in in these uh um challenging circumstances where your normal support network is is not available yes absolutely there's a there's a really i mean i love this interaction i love that you guys are participating right. so much um okay uh harry you were saying that working remotely makes collaboration issues very explicit True that. And you know what? I learned a really important lesson Yes, just yesterday. I've been going round and round in circles with something and, you know, complaining a little bit under my breath that people were not collaborating. And, uh, and you know, it is true. People were not collaborating mm -hmm. using the standard collaboration tools. And I kept sending out PowerPoints because I was told to do PowerPoints. I said, hold on a second, let me pick up the phone. I didn't really pick up the phone. I, you know, I put a Teams call and in half hour, I saw something that I was going around that I've been 
you know, driving me insane for a couple of weeks. So yes, collaboration issues come to the surface, but sometimes we are the collaboration issues and we forget that collaboration doesn't just mean tools. It means specifically one-to-one. Funny story, uh, my previous company did not believe in work from home and you always have to take a day off if you can make it to the office. And now they are preaching the world how to effectively work from home. I'm not going to ask you, Ankit, what your company is, but it really is a funny story. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some other challenges that popped up since COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, sorry. Um, here we go. So a couple more challenges. So, um, and I think this this gets to some of your points as well. You know, it's a lot harder, of course, uh, uh, when we're not in the same space together to notice when people need support or when they actually have support to offer as well. It's, uh, it can go uh, unnoticed for a lot longer. So the question is, how are we able as leaders to provide um to provide that support, but also, you know, to balance the, the need for performance, but also for mental health, right? It's a lot harder to pick up those subtleties and, um, and you know, keep that high level of trust uh, uh, alive and well. It needs a lot of nurturing and yeah. a lot of that nurturing actually comes through. Um, we'll come to that in more points, but it comes through in, uh, in actually face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and because of that, uh you know, keeping morale is and maintaining team engagement is really difficult, you know, mm -hmm. and much, much as we love being at home and um, uh, and much, much as it is important to be on video, it's also exhausting. You're mm -hmm. always on, you know, you can never really switch off. And, and so for a leader, being present, being really there becomes you know, becomes even more draining uh, because uh, you can't do the impromptu, hey, you know, yeah. let's go for a cup of coffee. Yeah. Everything has to be intentional and planned. And you look Set at your change. diary, mm -hmm. in a, some, some days I look at my diary and I'm like, oh, how am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, what if I want to go to the kitchen and get a glass of water? And granted, now we're going back to the office, so it's not every day, but it, it still is most day. Mm -hmm. um, and so protecting time is really difficult. All in all, I think, uh, you know, keeping a balance, you know, we talk about work-life balance, keeping a balance is trickier. Uh, it used to be that, you know, you went to the office and then you went home. And yes, of course, you know, for us knowledge workers, work never stops. But but there was a boundary. There was a transition. You know, you got on the train, you got in your car, on your bike. Now we don't have that. Your mm -hmm. commute is from the bedroom to the living room and sometimes from the bedroom to the bedroom. And so finding a healthy balance is bizarre we feel the need to always be um to always be there i've also heard from a lot of people where there's a lot of pull from the organization yeah. as well that expectation that's you're always there because what else would you be doing you know yeah um, you're at home <laughs> you better be on video uh, in that meeting in the next one in the next one so being a lot more intentional about setting some boundaries and some healthy uh boundaries has become really important. And it's important to model that kind of behavior yeah. for other people, because when you model balance, you give people in your team yeah. permission to balance. And that's that that is a really critical stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the, we one of the questions we ask is, uh, you know, if you're we're talking here to experienced leaders, uh, if you had to change something, if you had to let go of something that you that was a, one of the tenets of your practice, what was that? And here's what they had to uh, tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, our, the traditional management models uh, don't tend to really <laughs> favor trust a whole lot, right? So we, we develop trust in our teams by a combination of seeing how they work, seeing their work, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, fundamentally, every act of trust we do or we commit to, uh, um, we commit to is intentional. And it's a risk that we're taking, yeah. right? If I trust Martina to do something yeah. for me, and then I really trust her and I let her do it, I'm taking a little challenge because yeah. if she messes up, 
it's on me as the manager. So overcoming this insecurity we've got about trust is um, fundamental to avoid micromanaging. Um, during the pandemic, I think one of the things that we had to let go is to stop focusing so much on targets. Mm -hmm. Uh, stop focusing so much on numbers. Priority has shifted from hitting an arbitrary value that was determined by someone uh, is not as important as focusing on the mental health and well being of the people around us. Because if those people burn out because we're driving them to pursue those KPIs, um, we're going to risk. Uh, to risk um, you know, their, their mental health, productivity down the line, churn, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's something that um, uh, th that was around, you know, giving for granted the ability uh, to see your work, your own work recognized, right? You have to work a lot harder to get the team recognized because yeah. now everybody's competing for the same space. It's not like you bump into your CEO and you can tell them, hey, by the way, we won that award or we uh, we, we got this project done or we got that client. You actively have to signal to someone that that has happened. And the space is... Um, uh, and the space is very crowded. Yes, Ankit, absolutely. Uh, and Chandan as well. Um, empath empathetic leaders understand and feel for the employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yes, leaders should always start uh, with, with, I trust you until you prove me otherwise. 200%. Martina and mm -hmm. I do a lot of work on you know, leadership and team dynamic. And, you know, we, we have a workshop that we've taken around the world that, that talks precisely about that. You are a manager if you don't trust and you don't care about your people. True leaders are something completely different. So speaking of true leaders, we spoke with new leaders um, because for them, it was a really big change. And yeah. we're gonna be, you know, we could talk about this, uh, you know, forever, but we're going to need to um, be a little quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Martina? Absolutely. So, uh, what's been new? And uh, I think really getting back to that sort of providing greater support for your team members and giving them the freedom to feel. Uh, um, Oh, let me feel their that. feelings. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, and making sure that they don't feel that pressure in those moments to perform, you know, actually speaking yeah. to the same thing. So if you need to add that, it's a really challenging sort of situation to to be um to be presented with. Um uh, how do you balance that? Um then um you know finding finding tools that actually help the team sort of organize their work you know uh, one team was suggesting that hey we work uh, we're working through asana to be, make that more effective you know insert that whatever tools uh, helping you to connect as a group and organize yourselves together and um you know going back to that proactive information sharing that the experienced leaders mentioned that over communicate document everything have it in a place where everyone can find it um really critical um also of course uh, adopting new tools right how do we bring those uh in-person activities into into the digital space unsurprisingly miro or uh, mural or any sort of interactive um uh, workshopping uh, um whiteboarding uh, loom to share updates with the team uh, and uh, you know new integrations and in slack uh, to all your other tools to to keep it all connected as well uh, uh, and uh, keep an overview of all the things that are happening and um, and of course those social chats right uh, new new discovery for uh, uh, new remote leaders but how do we balance that you know keeping those social uh, conversations going, you know, when everything is a formal, uh, you know, on the surface, a formal uh, 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 scheduled meeting, you know, um, figuring out how, how do you, how do you keep that sort of, um, yeah, how do you make it, uh, how do you have- How do you make it balance ways? effectively? Yeah. Yeah. And so to the previous point about uh, camera fatigue or Zoom fatigue yeah. and, and, you know, the, 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 and body fatigue of sitting down at a desk all day, um, you know, walking meetings are a great way, uh, great response. Uh, I, I, during the pandemic, I tried 
to do as many as I could, where I was explicitly telling uh, my team in my one-to-ones, let's take this as a walking meeting, phone only. There's mm. no actions on the back of that. I want to chat with you. I want to connect with you. Um, let's just have a chat where, while we're walking so we get some exercise, right? And we had like friendly competitions uh, as to who was walking more steps, et cetera, et cetera. Really sweet. Yeah. So in terms of challenging, um, you know, uh, as we've seen, uh, being being true to self, being honest, being personable uh, is especially important, is very important under normal circumstances, uh, but translating that personal approach to a virtual world is very difficult. And, and I think it's even more so difficult if you are relatively new to leadership and so you're still trying to find the boundaries between yeah. being an individual contributor and someone who's responsible for other uh, people's well-being. Um, a lot of the challenges have been that we've seen um, is onboarding during lockdown. So I, I was really lucky in that my own I changed jobs during the pandemic and my my onboarding both on the technical and social side was phenomenal but we've seen a lot of responses um where uh while the technological side of things work really well getting a sense of the culture of the organization is a lot more difficult developing those relationships so the social the social side uh, of um, onboarding is very, very has been very challenging, and uh, and yes, if you're new to leadership and you're new to understanding people and reading mm. between the lines, it is much harder to see when people are struggling if you only see them across mm. the screen or maybe not across the screen. And and you can see that people that were new to leadership were actually. Um, struggling with communications um so building relationship uh uh building relationship and keeping people informed and mm -hmm. over communicating as we've seen earlier mm -hmm. are a lot more difficult if you don't have that muscle developed mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> unexpected not unexpectedly they had uh they you know they report having had to let go of expecting to be on top of everything yeah. and that's something that i remember doing too when i was a when i was a new manager right and you too yeah. Yeah. i remember when we started you felt like you had to to keep everything yeah. under control yeah. and and so it was it was really hard perfection actually that's my favorite too I, that i had to unlearn when i uh, started on this journey is, is that you know you can't be that heavily involved in that detail you can't micromanage it can't uh, you know um perfection is really uh is really not a goal uh, and and unlearning that is, uh, is a really important lesson as a leader um yeah so um and then there were common uh, couple of commonalities uh, across both groups but before we go into this uh you know we're getting closer to the end i would like to forewarn everybody that we are going to have an interactive q a so we're going to start with a question from martina and i yeah. to you yeah. And that will jump start. So, so get ready to participate. Although I see you, you need absolutely no encouragement. Now, Couple both minutes. groups, um, um, you know, we asked them, what did you wish you'd known yeah. going into that? Uh, that um, so one of the things was around letting go of the expectation that things would be done in the same way as in the physical environment. Um, things are different. Yeah. We can uh, we cannot expect, and they could not expect to keep the same thing. And of course, yeah. that's the adjustment period. Um, there's there was also a realization around habits, ritual, and practices, and how they are much more important remotely than in person because they anchor those relationships, especially if they're of a personal nature. Especially how much more time and effort you need to put into them to actually reap the rewards. Yes, and then 
this this was particularly interesting that I can not model teams uh, the way teams work on the back of my experience, mm-hmm. and that's all part of letting go, empowering, and enabling. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, we also had a few nice surprises. And, um, you know, for some teams that was, hey, when the rest of the uh, organization went remote, it became a lot easier for us as a remote team to feel like uh, that we belong, like as a first class citizen, um, that the org has done a lot of small things for people to feel connected, you know, um, sending out little gifts to, um, to team members. Uh, a real nice morale booster that wasn't uh, wasn't a great lot of effort, but a nice forethought. Uh, forethought. Um, and um, heard from a lot of people how much closer they're feeling to their co-workers now that they've had more of a sort of window in their personal lives than they've ever had before when they were working together in the office. And, and then we asked people, what would you, you know, you've been through this. Yeah. Uh, what would you want to tell other people yeah. that may go through this in the future or are starting to go through this mm-hmm. and and the the first bit of advice i think it's spot on there is not one way to do this right uh mm-hmm. this right um much like honestly there is no one way to do in-person leadership right you know it's all about the right approach for the right people with the right tools and the right processes and the right protocols at this specific time. Uh, the other, the, the, the second one, you know, in one of the comments we said, or oh, someone said, oh, I wish I knew how to implement servant leadership. And, and I think that the flip side of that is that uh, as leaders, we need to be able to roll up our sleeves, jump in in the work and say, and, and show curiosity, dedication, willingness to support. Uh, when, when the team sees that, um, that's when they, they learn to respect you. That's when they know that you're not going to leave them out, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in trouble. And then there was something around creating psychological safety. And I know that psychological safety is something that everybody talks about these days, but really make it safe uh, for people to share, Mm -hmm. give them different channels. Uh, You know, the one thing that I tell my, my team at work is you can text me, you can WhatsApp me, you can Mm -hmm. send me a message on team, you can send me an email, you can uh, you know, I have an anonymous form if there's something you want to tell me and, you, you know, and, and you don't want me to know mm-hmm. who it is. It doesn't really matter how you do it. You, you know, as a leader, you're at the service of others and you need to create a site, you know, a safe place for them to be able to come uh, with you and help them design the organization that you want. Mm-hmm. And what do you wish for? And I think uh, looking at people who have done this for a long time, you know, uh, uh, it's been exhausting. Like the pandemic has been an incredibly exhausting uh, experience. So, you know, they miss being able to uh, to meet people in person. And of course, we're coming back out of that where we have more opportunities again to do that. But, you know, um, just realizing how much those in-person uh, um uh, interactions, connections, hugs, uh, sharing, conversations are really fueling that uh, your own motivation and energy as well. Um, and actually, the flip side of what we were saying earlier, you know, some people were saying, like, oh, I wish I had more uh, bu- budget for fun. Even if it's a very modest budget, it goes a really long way because, um, you know, the pandemic was all so obviously uh, tied to a lot of um, economic uncertainty and budget cuts for for a lot of teams. So, you know, having to make do with a lot less and trying to figure out, but how can I create as a leader? How can I create that social connection and that, you know, that message that I care, we care, um, uh, fi- finding those opportunities small, uh, small or large. I'm popping the question in the chat. I That's love coming. it. I love it. And then uh, finally here, I wish organizations would share more information. And this is really, you know, where we started with this, uh, with this survey as well, with, with this uh, research project. We really wish people would uh, share a lot more 
between organizations outside of my own bubble, outside of my own circle of friends or outside of my own company, you know, it's really hard to figure out all of this stuff by yourself or in, in isolation. We really want to hear about how other people are uh, solving these problems. These are hard challenges, right? There is no one right answer. Um, so really um, an appeal also to everyone here, and thank you so much for all your sharing. Um, to, to share with each other, how do we do this better, right? How, uh, what's worked, what's not worked? And in different contexts, different things work. So really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, um, I, I think that this is the biggest thing and uh, we've heard we've heard mm -hmm. it from everybody. Um, we all want to look good. We all want to look like we know what we're doing, uh, but it'd be really refreshing to have a proper conversation mm -hmm. at leadership level uh an organizational level in you know in figuring out things that you know had made a difference for the people that matter which is the people yeah. that uh um for the people that uh are in the organization and yes i know we are at the end of our session so the question for us um from us to you i popped it in the chat is so this was the pandemic, but you know we've slowly started to return to the office. Um, how was it for you? So Hemant said it's good to be back. It looks like a new planet. Oh, that's that's really good. Can we hear more about? It looks like a new planet. And of course, conversely, while people mm -hmm. share what it feels for them, if you have questions for us. Uh, by all means, uh, do let us know. And as the answers keep coming through, mm -hmm. our parting thoughts are, you know, around seven things that uh, we invite everybody to remember, uh, seven practices, leading remotely during pandemic and uh, leading remotely are two different things. We need to invest in good tech. We need to communicate up, down, and sideways. Um, we need to get creative with making space for personal connect, connection remotely by all means. We need to learn to let go of perfection. Um, yes, and that means also productivity being reduced now that we're back to the office. Yeah. You can be perfect. And we need to create safe spaces to build trust, but mostly, being kind to ourselves and others and that's exactly what Bavin was saying productivity reduce because of commute and connect if you feel awesome you're being kind to yourself that's what mm -hmm. we would like yeah. to what we want to say uh yes few people in the office absolutely here in um in the uk is the same and yeah. uh little by little uh the, the truth is that we never really thought we'd have to do this but we are doing it and somehow it's working thank you so much for being with us mm -hmm. uh jitendra do we have um time for questions uh, so we are uh, unfortunately At running time? Out of time right now so but it was a great exciting session insightful full fully energetic and I think uh, even all the participants were, you know, totally engraved into the discussion. Thank you so much for having us, Jitendra, and everybody.